Good morning. All right. Who ticked off old man winter? It was nice yesterday. What happened? Uh, however, despite the chill this morning, uh, I am so glad to see all of you. Today is a lovely day here at the church inside where we are protected from the, uh, from the, uh, the chill and the rain, but also where our hearts are warmed by our fellowship with one another and by the wonderful things that are taking place in this community. So today is a day of celebration. I invite you to take a moment now to enjoy this congregation, to enjoy this space as we prepare to come before our God this morning with thanksgiving and worship through the music of our choral call.
grateful it is. O God, who in Jesus revealed the love that endows life with significance, the purpose that gives direction to humanity, and the power that ends the power of the death. You are our Lord. We worship you for your revelation in Jesus calls for nothing less than our devotion. From this storehouse of riches, we have continually drawn, yet the treasure has not been depleted. For like all the spiritual gifts with which you have entrusted us, it is something we can lose only by failing to use it. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will so rule in our hearts, that we will make you known, not only in the breaking of bread, but in the sharing of the bread, that we shall shoulder the cross you care for the poor and the oppressed, that we shall recognize that repentance, like charity, must begin at home, that we shall accept the forgiveness of Christ, not merely as a revelation of the divine character, but as a model for human behavior, and that we shall bring into being the fellowship that Jesus calls us all into. Amen.
So I will be leaving tomorrow morning and I'll be returning midday on Thursday. So uh, in the meantime, please direct all of your calls to the church office and they will hook you up with the appropriate people to uh, handle things in my absence. Uh, in my absence, though, the Bible study will continue. They're going through the final week of their film series this, third, uh, this Wednesday at 7.30, and we'll be beginning our new study next week, uh, Wednesday at 7.30. Uh, if you're interested in joining that study and have not already spoken to me, please let me know, and I'll be sure to get you a copy of the book. Uh, and finally, no, nope, not finally, there's so much more. So much more. Uh, there's a deacons meeting next week, so deacons, uh, just a reminder that uh, we'll be meeting in Thelma Mountain next week, and the week following that will be the deacons retreat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look in your bulletins, there's a small uh, insert. Uh, Unity Coalition of Greater Freehold invites you to the forum, informing our future learning from our past. This is a uh, group that I'm involved in, in here in, uh, in Freehold. It's a collection of clergy members and uh, community members uh, who are seeking to build uh, a stronger sense of unity for the Freehold area. And so this is uh, their first outing, um, and it is a, a collection of uh, speakers talking about the educational system's history and impact within Freehold. So that'll be held at the Court Street School on May 6th uh, from 3 to 5. Uh, you're all invited. Invite your friends. I have to talk a little bit at that because I was late to the meeting and I got nominated when I wasn't there. <laughs> you know how that goes. So uh, if you're not tired of hearing me speak at that point, feel free to join us for that. And finally, uh, uh, last call on the Easter flowers. Uh, most of them have, uh, have started to, to wilt, but their bulbs are still viable. They can be found in the young men's room. Any of you who are interested in taking some of the bulbs and planting in your garden, please do so by today, otherwise we're going to have to get rid of them. That was long-winded, but I'm done now. Are there any other announcements for the good of the congregation at this time? And, well, in that case, uh, before we go to our children's moment, uh, I'm going to invite Bruce Krawinski to join me at the front of the church. <coughs> January, we started looking for a new administrative assistant here at the church. And we were lucky enough to, to find someone who has uh, been fitting in quite well so far. But before we, uh, we found our new, uh, our new administrative assistant, we were uh, blessed to have so many people who were helping to keep this church running smoothly, helping to make sure that things didn't fall through the cracks, helping to make sure that our office um, kept functioning and kept us united as a Christian family. So this time, at this time, Bruce and I would like to personally thank all of the people that uh, helped out keeping our church office running. So Jeanette, would you come forward? And Judy, and Moni, and Arlene, and Nancy, I'm not going to make you come all the way down. Stand up. I said your name. Ladies, these are just a small token of our esteem. Uh, if it were not for all of you, we certainly would not have been able to keep ourselves going in the fashion that we were. Uh, you guys are the church. You are the ones that helped maintain the standards that we have here and helped maintain an engaging and welcoming presence to the people that came into this building, to the people that were reached by our newsletter, to the people that uh, see us through our printed word and through our uh, our presence in the office. So uh, thank you all very much for all that you did. We literally could not have done it without you. And folks, I believe they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> and at this point, I'm going to put our new administrative assistant, Colleen, on the spot. Colleen, why don't you come on down? Ladies, you can all go ahead. And yeah. I'm not going to make you stand in the spotlight for longer than it feels comfortable. I would like to take 
take this opportunity to introduce you to our new administrative assistant, Colleen Schultz-Nielsen. She's been with us since the week before Easter, so she started her job here with a trial by fire, going through the busy, busiest couple weeks of the Christian year. So uh, at the reception afterwards, I invite you all to introduce yourselves to Colleen if you have not had a chance to do so before, and start to get to know her as the newest member of our uh, First Baptist family. So ladies, do you notice anything different today? You brought in all of that stuff. Yeah, that's very helpful because that's going to go help some people that are in need of, you know, basic stuff like towels and socks and all of the stuff that we just think we have at our houses. Not everyone has that. Notice anything else different? Did you notice there's a swimming pool right there? <laughs> yourself, you take a bath in order to get clean. And in the Christian faith, we believe that in order to sort of prepare ourselves to be better Christians, we need to wash up some of the stuff that's gotten us mm, a little bit dirty in our lives. Some of the stuff that makes us sad or angry or upset. The things that make us a little bit less than we want to be. So symbolically, You guys know what symbolically means? I realize that's a big word. It actually means symbols. It does mean symbols, yes. Um, so we get people to come down into the, into the water, and it's, it's kind of like a bath, but it's not for our bodies, it's for our spirits. And it makes us feel closer and more connected to Jesus. So today, we're going to welcome some new people into the church. We're going to welcome your mom, and your grandpa, and your grandma, and we're going to welcome Miss Judy over there. And they're going to join their church. And they were all spoil sports who had been baptized before, so I didn't get to bet, I didn't get to dunk anybody today. But I wanted you guys to see this because at some point in the future, we're going to welcome some people into this church who haven't been baptized before. And you're going to see this, and you're going to see me in there in my special hip waders that I got for my ordination. It doesn't look like a pool. I mean, it looks like a big square full of water. A big, if, all right, if it's. It doesn't look like a pool, but it's a big square full of water. What does that make a pool? Make a pool. Too, small. Too small? I used to go swimming in that when I was in the size. Not this one. Another one very much like it. But anyway, uh, at some point in the future, we're going to use that for a baptism. You guys are going to see that. But I just wanted you guys to take a look at that because when people join the church today, they've already going... What's that? No, we're not going to see people naked today. That is generally not a thing that happens in church. Generally. Generally. But I just wanted you guys to see this and remember this so that when it may come your time to be baptized, you'll know a little bit better about that. So you guys can go join your families again. And at that point, I'm actually going to invite most of Emma's family to come down here. So, Lynn and Joan and Vern, why don't you come on down? Judy wanted to come on down to. So you guys can stay right here for now. And uh, deacons, I'm going to invite all of you to come and stand over here. So folks,
Friends, I invite you to look in your bulletins now for a sheet that looks like this. It's either green or white. It's a special insert in your bulletin. And folks in the audience, you get it easy. Your, your responses don't come to the second page, so you get to just hang out for now. Friends, it is my great pleasure this morning to introduce you to our, the newest members of, of this church. They have met with the Board of Deacons and they have been found uh, to be of good Christian character and to be candidates for membership in our new family. We are here this morning to welcome these new members into the community of the First Baptist Church of Freehold. We are not a building, but we are the gathered family of God. We are sisters and brothers in Christ, given our new identities through our baptism into Jesus' death and to his resurrection. Today we welcome each of you as members of this family in the larger body of Christ. Folks, I present to you Lynn Greenwell, who is Emma's mom. And I present to you her mother, Joan Hayes, her husband, Vern Hayes, and on the end, Judith Kress. They have met with members of our Board of Deacons. They have testified to their Christian experience and had a chance to become more fully involved in the life of this church. They bring with them a variety of experiences. They bring with them a variety of passions for the life of this church. And after our service today, I invite you all, if you have not met them before, to introduce yourselves to them at the reception that follows and to find, more, uh, find new ways in which your life can be enriched by coming to know theirs. Folks, is it your wish to make this community of faith, the First Baptist Church, your church family, and the people with whom you will share your journey of faith, is this the place and are these the people with whom you will seek to make sense of the issues of your life, your dreams, your faith, who you are, what you are to do, who God, God calls you to be? Is it your wish to make this the place where you continue your journey into greater health and wholeness, where you listen to the song of God's salvation and the good news of Jesus Christ, allowing Jesus to be an example and a teacher to you, where you are called to a life of ministry and justice, and where you are fed at the table of new life? Yes. 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 Will you commit yourself to seek and serve Christ in union with this community of faith? I will. God, God, God. Will you pledge your spiritual, social, and financial support to this parish family? I will. God, 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 God. God. All right, folks, this is your part of this. Will you who are members of this faith community, who are witnessing these promises, share the joys and sorrows and do all in your power to support these persons in their life in Christ. We will. will you welcome Lynn and Joan and Vern and Judy into this family of First Baptists? Embrace their gifts, their needs, and their dreams. Will you recognize that their presence and participation will change the shape of the body and help it grow in new ways? Will you support them in their journeys? and assist them in their ministries. We welcome, we welcome you as fellow workers in God's kingdom, inviting you to grow with us in our faith, reaching out to others with the good news of Jesus Christ. We welcome you as sisters and brothers in Christ, and thank God for this unique opportunity to serve God. two or more are gathered in your name. There you are with them. 
Help us, we pray, to see and feel that presence, and that others may come to know you through their interactions with us. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends, welcome to the church. Friends, our, our new members bring us much to be thankful for. As, the, as we just heard in our short program, they will change the shape of this church. They will offer new insights, new ideas, new ways of being Christian. They are something for us to be thankful for. Are there other things to be thankful for this morning? Are there things to be thankful for to be lifted up before this congregation? Are there sorrows to be lifted up before this congregation? so that all of these things may be brought before the God who brings all of us together. Friends, let us pray together. Lord, in this Easter season, the light of your love shines on, illuminating the places where you are present in our lives. As your bewildered disciples once pondered the stories of your appearance, you penetrated the darkness of their fear and doubt with your words of peace. You showed them the appalling marks of evil pierced on your hands and feet. And you opened their minds to understand why you had to die to defeat such evil and death. Send such understanding into our lives this morning, we pray. Open our minds and hearts to receive you, Lord. Speak your words of peace to us here. Let your love shine on any dark areas in our lives as we turn to you now in silence.
gracious God, you continually give to us your greatest gift, your Son Jesus. Yet sometimes we still have difficulty understanding how to welcome that gift into our lives. You call us to be people of courage and hope, and yet sometimes we run and hide, doubting and fearing. You challenge us to proclaim our faith, but all too often we huddle in darkness, whispering our words of discouragement. Shake us up, Lord. Forgive us when we seem to need prodding over and over again. Help us to see the presence of Jesus in our lives, in the lives of those around us, and remind us of all that he taught us, to help us to live as disciples, serving you, by serving others. Change us, remold us, we pray. Make us truly the disciples you have called us to be. Lord of darkness and Lord of the dawn that follows, we are so grateful for your gentle mercies. You see our fear and doubt, our suspicion and our mistrust. And you banish them from our lives, replacing them with hope and peace and love joy. You have called us to be your witnesses to all of the world, unafraid of what others might think or say about us. We have been invited out of the darkened highways where fear dwells, into the light of your world. We have been called as emissaries of hope and justice, peace and compassion. Be with us as we participate in the ministries of healing and hope that your church offers to members, friends, and strangers alike. Give us courage and strength to be your disciples in all of the circumstances of our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name and with the words which he taught to us, praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
give thanks for your gift, your son Jesus, the author of life, whom you raised from the dead. You continue to bring about marvelous miracles of forgiveness, bringing healing and new life in our midst. We know that these gifts that we have assembled this morning don't come from our power or our piety, but come to us through your goodness. As we reach out to people in our community, as we reach out to the people who are served by the Philadelphia Racetrack Mission, May all of them draw closer to you. Let our offerings this morning contribute to the ongoing work of your Son, here, now, in this place, in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is number 338, fitting for our new members, Lord, I want to be a Christian.
people would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took the man by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. While the man clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico, called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. Our second lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, starting in the 24th chapter with the 36th verse, and that can be found on page 861. While they were talking about all that had happened, Jesus himself appeared among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh or bones, as you see that I have. And when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus is it written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on that third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. Today we are the witnesses of these things, and may that same understanding that rested upon the disciples that day rest upon us in our worship this
you stop believing that God could change your life? Maybe that's an odd way to begin this morning. When did you stop believing that God could change your life? It's an odd question when we have dedicated this day to new beginnings, welcoming new members, celebrating our volunteers, welcoming a new staff member. But the question remains, when? It is a question that comes to all pastors and parishioners and popes. We all have that moment in our lives when we become certain of one thing. We become convinced that God says this or God says that. And that is the end of the story. Or perhaps God doesn't say this or that. Perhaps the silence when we expect a reply says it all instead. One of the first times I remember encountering this, I was, I was little, I was younger than probably uh, Cassidy was. I wanted a bike, or I wanted superpowers like the comic book heroes that I was reading had. And those are the wishes of a child. Those are easy enough to have them disproved, even though it's hard to reconcile that when you're a disappointed kid. I wanted those things, and I thought God was going to give them to me. But it wasn't to be, as it is in so many other things. As I grew up, as I matured in both life and in faith, I came to understand that work was required, that, that God works with and through and within those who show up, that we are invited to become co-workers with Christ, to see God working in the places where we are doing outreach, not diminishing what God can do in our lives, but giving testimony to it, that because of our faith, because of our belief, we undertake these efforts. And oddly enough, this is why I asked the question this morning, because that, that understanding can lead us to a dangerous place where we begin to confuse our work with God's work. We get accustomed to the things that we do because of our faith. And we stop expecting God to show us something new. We stop expecting God to show us something that radically changes how we live, how we think, how we act. Now, it's easy enough to see this uh, in you know, egregious examples within our culture. All of the hucksters and the charlatans and the bigots who hold up the Bible as a justification to further their own agendas. Those words in red become, uh, you know, bullet points on their uh, on their quest to further their own ends. It's easy to see that type of understanding in those for whom the words of God and their own self will are indistinguishable. But it's harder to see in all of the ways that I have substituted my own understanding. The times when I thought I understand, I understood what God was doing in my life and the life of others better than I did. The times that I didn't think I had anything new to learn. And it's okay to laugh at that. I'm 36 years old and I thought I didn't have anything to learn. You wouldn't be laughing at me right now. You remember about a month ago I went down to North Carolina for a conference. Uh, this conference was uh, uh, reckoning why people are still Christian. The name of the Christian conference was Why Christian? Why are you still a Christian? Uh, it was reckoning with how one is a Christian in this, in this day, this age, this culture. And I had gone there looking for insights for how to reach younger people, how to reach out to, to millennials, kids, People that, you know, we are not seeing as much of in our, in our community, but also in the larger Christian community. And when I got there, I was not the youngest person in that place. But if you put it on a pie chart, or, uh, you know, plot it on a chart, um, I, I was definitely near the bottom there. And as I looked around at all of these people who, uh, 
could have been my, my parents. Um, I thought to myself, this is not what I came for. This was not reflective of this sort of outreach to, to, to the younger folks. I was sitting there in the first day of that conference and I was, I was salty. I flew all that, no, don't get me wrong, I got to see my sister, I got some barbecue, I was enjoying myself, it was lovely weather, but I was like, all right, this is coming up a little bit short. And then, then it actually got started. And 1,300 people got to their feet, and they all sang, I'll fly away, this is the hymn that we closed with last week. And in that moment, hearing those voices blend, Hearing the dedication, the yearning behind those words, I received a new spirit in that place. I entered into Duke Chapel looking at the differences between myself and the people who were gathered there. I thought I knew why they were there. I thought I knew who they were. And I thought that meant that they didn't have anything to teach me. But in worship, I saw that we were looking for the same thing. And even if we weren't looking for the exact same thing, we were looking in, for it in the same place. I saw them differently. I saw God working in a different way in my life and their lives. Now, in that moment, I was awed and I was humbled and I took a lesson back home with me to share with you all today. But I wasn't startled or terrified as the disciples were when they encountered the risen Christ as we heard in this morning's lesson. I wasn't startled or terrified, but I saw how small my mind had become about this one thing. It's not on the same scale, but my experience there in North Carolina gave me some insight for the disciples encountering Jesus. Much like the story of Thomas that we heard last week. Thomas who doubts, Thomas who needed proof. And Thomas who understood what Jesus meant by laying down his life. They understood. These disciples understood. I thought I understood. I thought I understood what God was doing, had done, was going to do. I did not expect more. And I suspect that the disciples did not expect more either. They had seen their friend taken. They had seen their friend placed on the cross and taken down and removed from the tomb. And God had done what God said. God was going to do. Those who had traveled alongside Jesus, those who had learned from him, saw what had happened, and they, they understood. But they didn't know what to make of what came after. They had been told that Jesus was going to rise on the third day, but it took them a while to reconcile that prophecy with the man that they saw before them in this instant. They needed to see the body, they needed to see him eat food before they fully understood that this was Jesus back, returned to them. God was doing a new thing in and amongst them. Jesus taught them new things about the scriptures, about themselves, preparing them be witnesses. We're going to come back to the witness bit later. This moment where Jesus comes back to his friends, where Jesus speaks to them of new things, opens new understandings to them, this is part of the necessary transformation that, bring, that brings Peter from the night of desertion in the Garden of Gethsemane to the empty tomb on Easter morning to the temple in the selection you heard from Acts to the place where he is the one not, he is the one not just telling about the miracles that he has seen but where he is the one working those miracles himself is the transformation that takes him from the place where his life is the one that has changed to the place where his faith changes the lives of others. In fact, in that lesson, we, we hear that he says he has nothing else to offer, 
no silver or gold, just his life, which was transformed by Jesus of Nazareth. And the life that he impacts there, the man who was carried in each day to beg for alms at the gate, we see another person whose understanding of life, whose understanding of God, is closed. The man has faith in God. His family brings his family and friends bring him to the temple so that he can receive alms from the faithful. But he stopped believing that God can change his life. Or at least stop believing that such a change would be miraculous. He goes to that temple each day. It's very clear to him how God works. God is present in every hand that passes him alms or food. But this man is still not prepared for something larger. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And the man fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something yeah. from them. How many times have you expected to receive something? How many times have you expected to receive something and shape your life around it? <clears throat> when my cousin Glenna was in high school, uh, this is a high school story. She's better now, but she was a teenager, so this doesn't come out with her looking great. Uh, when she was in high school, uh, her boyfriend waited all day to give her a Valentine's Day present. And uh, it just made her mad. She expected to be greeted with flowers or a card or whatever she was going to get first thing in the morning. But the boyfriend had a surprise in mind, and he held it off to the afternoon. And by the time that the afternoon came around, the absence of those gifts all day had started to work on her and made her kind of angry and resentful. So much so that she wasn't necessarily open to the love and the gift that she did receive at the end of the day. It's not just a problem for high school students. Sometimes we have a problem with not getting what it is that we expect. Uh, at my previous church, uh, I only preached about once a month, and my my senior pastor there, uh, you know, uh, did a very like uh, traditional Bible-based preaching thing, some of what I'm trying to carry on here. But because he had that, and because I worked with kids, I tried to cast my net wide and bring in the stuff that they weren't going to hear from the senior pastor. And after hearing one of those sermons, someone wrote me a two-page letter telling me that uh, I was not doing a great job as a pastor. <laughs> and the line that still stands out to me to this day is, he said church should be comfortable like an old sweater. Now, that's not a bad thing. I have some old sweaters that are exceedingly comfortable. But old sweaters wear out. Old sweaters fall apart over time. And if you darn up the holes in them too often, they become a Frankenstein. They become something unrecognizable. Sometimes you need to work, start work on a new sweater. In this time of Easter, Scripture obliges us to return to these stories. We hear about Jesus appearing to his disciples this week. We heard about it last week. We heard about it the week before. We return to these stories because Easter asks us to be transformed by them over and over and over. Because Easter does not end when Jesus appears in the upper room. It does not end when he encounters the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It does not end when Peter works his miracle in Solomon's portico, nor does it end in Pentecost when the tongues of fire is sent. Easter obliges us to be born over and over again, to continue to have our lives and our circumstances, even our very hope, transformed. Easter asks that we become witnesses. Now, you remember earlier I said we were going to come back to witnesses. Both of these lessons contain the word witnesses. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. But you 
rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God has raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. Witnesses. Observers. Those who have seen. But think about what you know. Think about every police report and crime drama you've seen. Witnesses are unreliable, not in the sense that what they see is untrue, but in that there are as many different impressions of an event as there are people who viewed it. Now thankfully, unlike a court of law, we do not have to determine whether something is true or false. We are not determining guilt or innocence. For us, witnesses, are those who react to the transformation in their lives worked by the presence of God. So your response and my response may be different. Your response and my response may look at some things in different ways. But that is simply the presence of God asking us to see a bigger picture one in which we are all co-workers together, informed by new understanding and new interpretation. This morning we have welcomed new members and new staff. And as a church family, we will be changed by them, and they will be changed by us. If it only worked one way, we'd be an army of clones, robots who only fulfill their condition. We wouldn't become stuck at some point on our journey from the Garden of Gethsemane to the tomb, to the road to the Emmaus, to the portico to Pentecost. We'd be stuck, unwilling and unable to change. So next week when we have our hymn sing, you may hear new voices asking to sing new hymns. We may find different food at our church potlucks. Some of you have already tasted uh, Burns baked beans. <laughs> There will be new calls to witness and new calls to service. Things that force us to, not force, allow us to grow in new ways. A month ago, we were not sending canned goods to Puerto Rico, unaware that our actions could have impact in a place that is so distant and yet so near. These new calls to witness enrich our worship. They forge new connections for us. They deepen our older ones. And so when I go to the North Shore Association rally this afternoon, I'm going to tell our story. I'm going to tell the story about welcoming new people into the church today. I'm going to tell them about the ways that our life and our common worship has changed in the six months since I was at this rally last. I will tell our story about how we are witnesses to the risen Christ working in and among us so that by our testimony, others may come to know. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is an insert and can be found in your bulletin. Christ has risen while the earth slumbers. I invite all of you to rise as you're able and join in the song. Thank you.
and in peace, proclaiming the risen Lord to all. May you be those who bring hope and justice to a hungry and hurting world. May the peace of the Lord be with you now and forever. Amen.